Well, Doss, we've, uh, we love talking to our guests pre-show and we're already getting into the footy nuff chat and trying to get a bit of insight, <laughs> guys, which we'll cover at some stage. But Nathan Freeman, welcome to the Doss and D Show. Thanks, boys. Yeah, it's good to be here. You can uh, sense some nuffness in amongst us. Can you feel it? Oh, a it's trade bit. period. It's our favourite time <laughs> of the year for you. I was just, as you said, we were having a chat before. I'm thinking this, this stuff's gold. We should get it rolling. But, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, no, nah, mate. Like grand final on the weekend. Trade period's coming up. It's probably, yeah, it's Nuffy's dream at the moment. It it's the best time of year. It is. Speaking of, uh, with the old Collingwood connection, which we'll talk about shortly, did you celebrate much on the weekend? Where's your allegiance? I, I did. My, oh, I'm a Saints supporter at heart. Yep. Um, growing Good up, man. Going up in, in Dingley, which is sort of Moorabbin territory. So... Um, everyone goes for the Saints down Bayside. So, but yeah, obviously got a fair few mates still playing for Collingwood. You know, you got Brazzy and Geordie Dugowie and all those types of boys who were around my age um, when I was there. And yeah, mm. I, I, was, I was stoked for those boys there. They've, uh, yeah, had a, like their last couple of years have been amazing. Like even, so Craig McRae was coach, uh, development coach when I was there as well. And yeah, mate, he was amazing. And then yeah. went, obviously went to Richmond, coached his own team, was highly successful. Went back to Collingwood. And it's probably no surprise that they've, come up so quickly and he's sort of out of those sort of one of those new age coaches that can just get the best out of every single player on the list so yeah it's it's yeah, it's funny because i think people are starting to warm to collingwood which is a bit unusual. Se- they're probably nearly my second team it's a little yeah. bit unusual so yeah it's uh he's done a good job if he uh if everyone's starting to get around him i mean i saw something yesterday and i'm sure you would have too Collingwood averaged the second biggest crowd in the world of any other sports team really you know who's number one brissa dortmund and calling it a second. No, I'm not joking. That's amazing. Like, yeah. and, and in that list, it's all soccer or football. I think one was me and you. The other one was Bayern Munich. Like, Collingwood is so big. I know they weren't probably as, like, they're in their peak of their powers right now. But um, when you were there, did you sense, oh, shit, this club's huge? Yeah, I think so. Like, I, I, growing up, I was a footy nuffy as well. Like, I love footy. I loved everything about the sport and, you know, on field, off field, and all that sort of stuff. So um, you definitely felt. Even from like draft night when I when I got first called out to, to go to Collingwood at you know pick ten in twenty thirteen, even just like the the media coverage I was getting compared to the other draftees, um, me and Matt Scharenberg, um, even like the the support on social media and and all that sort of stuff. I think you sort of find out that Collingwood's not just like any other club. There's there's a lot more. Um, not scrutiny, but a lot more attention, a lot more media attention on, on the club and the players. So, yeah, I think it was literally instantly from day one, you, you realise, geez, this is this is a big club and they're, they're pretty important. Mm. Take us through to draft night. Did you know you were going to Collingwood or how confident were you that you are going to end up there or which team did you think you might have ended up at? Yeah, it was a funny one. I think probably leading up probably the month into the draft, and this is pre-pick uh, uh, swap, so you couldn't, yeah. couldn't trade picks. Um, so once, you know, the, the season was finished and the draft order was set, it was set, so... We had a little bit more of an idea where we we're going to go. And I think I was sort of sitting around that, you know, late top 10 sort of sort of bracket. Um, and Melbourne had picked nine, Collingwood had picked 10. I think probably leading up to the draft, I was thinking I was going to go to Melbourne. Yeah. Um, but I think on the day of the draft, Paul Connors, my manager, sat me down. We're up in the Gold Coast because, the you know, the top first round, have to go up there to, to go on stage and whatnot. Um, he sort of said, you know, if you get to Melbourne, but you and Christian Salem are there, they're going to take Salem and Collingwood will take you. But... If Salem's gone, Melbourne going to take you. So right. basically sitting out, I, I, I was pretty happy because I knew I was either going to go to Melbourne or Collingwood. Um, so yeah. obviously being a Vic boy, I was pretty happy about that. But um, yeah, got to pick nine, Christian Salem went. So I sort of knew I was going to go pick 10 to Collingwood and um, yeah, got up on stage and shook Bucks's hand. And then, yeah, as I said before, it was go, go, go nonstop from there. So um, yeah, I was, I was pretty wrapped. I mean... Uh, I would have gone, you would have gone anyway. If you told me yeah. when I was 16, you know, you're going to be playing AFL, you wouldn't care if you're playing on the moon. Like you, yeah. you, you're just so stoked to get an opportunity. So um, going to, to Collingwood, the biggest sort of club in the, in, you know, especially Victoria. Um, yeah, I was pretty wrapped. Well, I remember uh, actually growing up would have been, you know, that 16, 15, 16, 17. And obviously a good mutual, a good mate of mine, a mutual friend of ours, Tommy Cap, who I know he'll be listening to this. Um, mate, because we used to get dirty on Cappy because he left twice, not didn't leave, but obviously he had to focus on his school footy for a while um, at Halebury. And he would just never shut up about the best player he's ever played with, which was Nathan Freeman. And I'm not joking. I'm not taking a piss. He always used to talk about Frio. Um, I guess my next question would be around the injury front um, because it just happened so quick, didn't it? I, I, and I was watching it live, I remember. It was in Geelong, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it was a big deal. I remember all the boys were watching it and within, you just it was just a ping, wasn't it? Yeah, so... It's funny, mate, like uh, growing up, I'd never, 
like that first hamstring against Geelong, that was my first soft tissue injury. Crazy. It was it, it, it sort of just happened and just snowballed from there. But yeah, like it was my first game at Collingwood. We were playing Geelong down in Geelong. Um, at the start of the second quarter, I'd yeah got a handball off Jamie Elliott down the wing, sort of just yeah tried to try to launch one over the back of Quentin Lynch. But it's a big cue, a big cue. <laughs> so um, yeah, try try to smack one out the back into the open grass. But yeah, it's uh, I just felt this massive sort of pop in my hamstring and. Yeah, I, uh, as I said, I'd never done a soft tissue before, so I had no idea what was going on, but it felt pretty bad. So luckily I was close to the uh, interchange bench and I sort of hobbled straight off. And yeah, well, the, the doc gave me a little test on the boundary to see if I'd done my hamstring and yeah, there was just nothing there. So yeah, I was uh, pretty bummed. That was my night done and subsequently the next two seasons. So I think I was sort of expecting to miss... I think I got told at the start I was going to be out four weeks, but it's t- it turned into bloody four years. So, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it was one of those things. And um, we, we don't actually still know how, how why or, or what happened. It was um, because it wasn't late in the game. I wasn't fatigued too much. It was just maybe my training loads were too high going into the to the game or, or something like that. So You yeah. might have just been overly excited. Mate, that, that, I probably Genuinely. was. I was running like, around like an Energizer Bunny in the first quarter <laughs> yeah. and just running around and – because, you know, it's the first game, yeah. so adrenaline's yeah. running high and, um, yeah, just one of those things. Crazy. I'm interested. You mentioned Nathan Buckley as your coach. The Bucks we see now on TV and, and here on radio seems very different to the Bucks 10 years ago. What was your experience with him as a coach? It's funny. Like, there, there, there was a lot of talk about how Bucks, even while he was co- coaching, you know, had such a dramatic change in the way he approaches coaching and his playing group. When I got there, I actually really um, – I really got on well with Bucks. Like, I, I found him – um, really approachable, really uh, obviously knowledgeable, as you yeah. see stuff in the media. He's got a really dry sense of humour that I really <laughs> found quite funny. But yeah, I mean, like he, he might have rubbed plays the wrong way, especially the ones that, you know, weren't, um, you know, the the 100% diligent professional players like the Scott Pendlebury's and the like. Um, you know, you, there was you know, a few rat bags and stuff at Collingwood back in the day. So um yeah, I mean, I got on really well with him. I thought he was a great coach. I didn't get to – so I left end of 2015. So I didn't really get to see that change yeah. um, in him that, you know, happened in, on the lead up to the 2018 granny. Um, but, yeah, from from all reports from the players, it, it was – as the results showed that they obviously made a grand final and something changed. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was quite um, – yeah, I, I quite really liked Bucks. Mm. Um, I can't really speak – to, to any other players, but yeah, from my personal opinion, I really liked him. And you loved your time at the Saints? Yeah, I, 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 I really did. I mean, I was at Saints for three years as well. I had Alan Richardson for, for the whole three years. Um, it was one of those things. When I was leaving Collingwood, I think I was offered a one-year contract to, to stay at Collingwood. Um, I'd, me and my manager, Paul Connors, I'd come off two years of not playing um, at all, at any level, basically. So... For me, it was just about length of contract and longevity. If it was a two-year deal, 100%, because I probably needed a year just to get my body back in, into you know match fitness and, and, and get it rehabbed and bulletproof so I could actually go out and play my best footy for the longest time I could. So I think uh, it sort of just dragged on and then um, a few other clubs you know came sniffing around and St Kilda was one that offered me a three-year deal, which you know it, that was enticing because I needed that time to get my body back and that was purely – the only reason um, that, that I was going to leave Collingwood. So, um, yeah, I, I ended up going getting traded to St Kilda um, at the end of 2015, stayed there till end of 2018. Um, and, yeah, it was, it was lucky I did because that first year at St Kilda, I was, I was shot. My body, I was still breaking down. I was still doing hamstrings. Um, I, yeah, I think I played three or four VFL games. I played a few of the development league, so the Resi, Resi's games, um, because it was better than training on a Saturday morning in the yeah, rehab group. Yeah, they sort of, yeah. There was a couple of those games where... What an insult to uh, those development boys. Oh, <laughs> nah, <laughs> it's a, it's a we, love, we love those <laughs> development boys, yeah. but it was, it was funny. I think, I think like Dill Robinson played a few of those as well. Yeah. And there was like, you know, Nico Kearney and those types of players. Josh Saunders, who was a gun player back in the day for St Kilda um, in, in, the, in the VFL. So, yeah, we sort of... Every, every weekend would have like a Saturday morning session, which would it'd be our biggest session of the week for the rehabbers. And... I think towards the end of my rehab, I sort of, you know, they go, oh, you can run around for a half in the in the resis, resis, or you can train, take that, train a one on one on a and see fit on a Saturday morning. So I was like, yeah, bloody oath, I'm playing. <laughs> yeah. So, 
yeah, run around a few of those games. But um, yeah, that, 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 that year was a real year of just sort of building my body back up and, and getting um, the moles in the legs and the, you know, hitting the, the reps in the gym and that sort of stuff. So yeah, I was lucky I had the, the longer contract because yeah, I would have um, been in some trouble if I'd only had a one year. Mm. Do, they, do they say to you, almost give you not a guarantee, but like, mate, we'll get your body right? Because you hear of blokes like Joe Danaher, for example, and apparently the big enticement to go to Brisbane was we're going to fix your body and you're going to play, which he has. Do clubs throw that at you as well, or wave that in your face and say, "This is a, like we'll get you right"? I don't think they'll ever say we'll definitely get you right, yeah. but they'll 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 sort of probably sort of explain what what the way they're different um, in their rehab and their gym protocols and their physio um, routines and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think you've just got to weigh up, you know, what you think is going to be the best approach for for your body and so sort of my body at the time. So, um, and I thought like I loved. It's funny, like it, there was, it's a misconception that I'd, I'd cracked it at the rehab gr- the staff and the physios at Collingwood for not getting my body right. Like I love those blokes. Like they were, they were amazing, absolute top of the class. Um, but I just needed the time to, to get my body right. Um, and I would have had no qualms staying at Collingwood. I wanted to stay, but um, it's just the, the, the best pure decision of what is going to you know, extend my career and, and I can get the most out of my body and I, I needed that longevity in the contract. So, yeah, like it's uh, it's just the way it turned out and um, I just thought going to St Kilda, you know, all things involved, whether it was, you know, the the footy um, department, the, the physio department, the rehab department and, um, you know, what was going to be best for me overall lifestyle um, yep. and that was, that was St Kilda. Did you go overseas at all for the for the hammy? Yeah, twice. I did. Was it Germany? I went or? to Germany. So can you Far explain out. that? Because that, <laughs> that gets talked about with, you know, I remember that being such a big thing. Yeah. yeah. Probably early 2010s. Yeah. I remember like, you know, I remember Adam Cooney, him going over there. Yeah. It was a massive thing. And I think- Max Rook, Ben Max Reed. Max Rook, you know, um, some big names. Dylan and Grimes, I think. Did he? Yeah. There's a fair few. Like maybe explain how that comes about yep. and then what happened. Yeah, I think uh, – I don't know who the, was the first player to go across. It might have been Max Rook when he was trying to get up for the grand final. But basically uh, there's a guy over in Germany called Hans Wilhelm Muller Wolfhart and he's the <laughs> – Well done. He, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's ingrained in my brain, mate. Yeah, we we spent a lot of time together, me and him. But <laughs> you and Hans. <laughs> me and Hans. <laughs> healing Hans, they call him. But, um, healing Hans. Healing yeah. Hans. So we uh, – so he's over in Munich and he's uh, Bayern Munich's club doctor. So wow. he's wow. He's, a, he's a fairly big deal um, and he's quite expensive and he's quite exclusive and he's hard to get into. So I think he's uh, – he was Usain Bolt's personal doctor. He was Cristiano Ronaldo, Vladimir Klitschko, um, a lot of like high, yeah. high-profile sports people around wow. the world. So um, – I think that's just always been an option there for players and AFL players. It's it's sort of like a last resort type thing. So I think uh, Andrew Wallace, our physio at St Kilda, end of 2015 season where I was – sorry, end of 2016 season, sorry. I was had that first year at St Kilda. I was rollercoaster up and down, still having injuries. He sort of said, hey, do you want to explore this? Do you want to go over to Germany? I'll go with you. We'll try it out. We'll get the treatment and come back and then hit pre-season running. So I said, buddy, oath, let's do it. Um, You know, I was – grateful for St Kilda they paid for me and while the physio to go over there so yeah we basically flew over there spent a week in Munich it's it's intensive so you go over to his clinic and you see him and he injects um oh some some sort of uh you know whatever it's called an injection in, in, all, all through your hamstring so it's about I don't know you'd probably get 30 or 40 injections a day or through your hamstrings wow. and, your, and your back yeah so um how many days are you doing this? You don't. I think it's a six-day protocol. So you're okay. there for about a week. Yeah. Yep. So you go every day. So one day he'll. So for me it was my hamstrings. So he'd inject my hamstrings, inject my back, and then you'd go see his chiro, you go see his physio, you go see his movement specialist, and like you'd it'd take a couple of hours, and then I'd I'd be stuffed after that. I'd be walking out of the clinic like a, like a grandma, and then go. <laughs> I'll go sit in the hotel room, and then for a couple of hours, and then meanwhile we'd go grab a bite to eat, sleep, and then do the exact same thing the next mm. day. So. There wasn't much sightseeing and much, you know, getting out about. It was uh, in and out, straight back home. Yeah, and no Oktoberfest. No Oktoberfest. <laughs> it was the time for October really? next no, day. Yeah. Oh, That's so there was, there was stuff going on everywhere. But, yeah, we did sneak into the, the Hof Brow House, for, Brow a, House. F- for a few steins oh, nice. um, on, on one of the nights. So that was good. But, yeah, went there one year. And then, um, thankfully, I played probably 13, 14 games in the VFL so next helped. year. Yeah, I think it helped. Yeah. So 
this is the thing. Like I can't, cause I was doing so much to rehab my body. I, I can't say it was hundred percent that it was, but mate, if it helped one, two, three, four percent mm. in my recovery, it, it, it was worth it. Yeah. So went out, had a really good year with my body, my body held up. So I think it was probably the first week of preseason, go back to St Kilda and they sort of said, do you want to go back again? And I was like, yep, I'll get out of a week of preseason. I'll go over to Munich. So actually the second time I paid my own way to go over there, um, sort of, yeah, went, went for the week. Um, and then, yeah, came back and hit preseason running. And yeah, that was my, uh, that was my third, before my third year at St Kilda, which yeah, I played, I started playing quite well. My body was holding up. So yeah, I mean, that was just one of the funny, funny things that I'd done. I've done so many things. I'd, Mate, like honestly, you name the treatment or you name the thing, like I'd I'd done it. So it's it's funny. Like I get I get players nowadays, and obviously through my you know experience in being a player manager, players who are injured or players who are down on form or or whatever else are encountering some sort of adversity. I'm um I get hit up quite a lot about yeah, things that they can do or things they've done, and so I think it's uh yeah most things I've done it, and I can I can give them a bit of a first hand uh, report on what it what it's like. So. How were you in the system? Five years. Yeah, in, five years. So, yeah. so in those five years, how many games did you play again? I played two, two AFL games and two NAB Cup games, which is just wow. crazy. So, crazy. I think I think I was working for one of the AFL ones too, actually. Yeah, yeah, you might, you probably would have been. I remember being behind the goals. It was because uh, <laughs> yeah. I was getting footy to out in the warm up, and uh, oh, yeah, yeah I, I remember that. I was fucking intimidated too. <laughs> I think you were calling for it. Wait, oh, shit. I was like, shit. Oh, yeah. you know? but but for white line fever. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for being in the system so long, and obviously being so frustrated during it. Tell us about how difficult it was when you're just constantly let down by your body. And yeah. do you have one eye on what's next? What happens if I can't get my body right? How, like, how do you prove that you're still of value to a team? Yeah. Talk to us through that period. It's funny, mate. Like, uh, as you said, I played two games. I think I was this, I think the second longest time from debut to, no, from drafted to debuting. So only thing, only one other player had gone longer after being drafted to debuting. So, wow. I mean, it was quite a unique sort of situation. But, yeah, I mean, like, it, as an athlete, your body's your tool, right? So, you, you can't actually do anything without, you know, your body being 100% right and being able to play. So, when your number one tool and the only thing that's, you know, stopping you from playing is stopping you from playing, you get quite, you know, it, 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 is, a, it is a bit of pill to swallow. I mean, yeah. as, as I said before, I didn't – I hadn't had a, a soft tissue injury. I hadn't had a major injury really um, up until that first one. So, and you know, I'm quite you know ADD hyperactive, and I just want to be go 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 and play and, and and just play footy. And when you can't do that, it's sort of like shit. What do I what do I do now? What I mean, that first probably year um, that that was okay because yeah. I, I'd never actually understood. Like I was just dipped straight into my rehab, get through. I'd probably was still thinking um, that, you know, I'll get my body right and I'll have a 10-year career and I'll, I'll still be all right. But I think once you get to that second year and the body still let me down that third year and I'm going, shit, I'm never going to get right. Um, I think I sort of and, – and, and I delved um, – I'm, you know, quite obsessive as a personality. So I went down the route of, you know, hyper training and hyper rehabbing and doing literally going above and beyond, like didn't drink for two years and just trying to do every little thing right, living like a monk. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I think that was like, it got to a point where it was detrimental to me actually recovering and yeah. you know, the stress of the stress of trying to get right was actually, you know, make taking me away from where I wanted to get to. So it was funny. I think probably the third, uh, third or fourth year, probably my fourth year, second year at St Kilda, I think I'd completely changed my mindset from, you know, I've got to do every little thing right and do everything right and, you know, not go out on the weekends and not, you know, I think I'd just changed from, you know, fuck it, if I don't get right, it is what it is. I, my family still love me. I've still got great yeah. mates. I'm still healthy. I've still got all my limbs. Like it's, uh, you sort of, I switched to that sort of, um, you know, what will be will be. And I just went out and I, I started having fun and playing, you know, having fun with my mates at training and, you know, just that, all that sort of stuff. And I just sort of became, it was funny. Like, I think I started integrating sort of humor into what, no, as a coping mechanism yeah. uh, sort of thing. Whereas I think in the, my first couple of years in the system, I might've been a bit, not hard to be around, but like, how do you approach this guy who's been injured for three years and he hasn't been out on the track and he's you know so uptight and so stressed. It's like, I yeah, think- How many times can you be asked, how's the hammy mate? Exactly yeah. right. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So it's like- my identity was like, Shit. as that was like my identity. Like I was an injured player, and I think mm. I adopted that identity as well. Yeah. And 
you know, it's through, you know, people, you know, the media as well. It was probably the most talked about zero game player for five years. Like <laughs> yeah. it was just, I was just known as, you know, the luckless midfielder, that luckless Collingwood midfielder, luckless St Kilda midfielder. It was just like my name. So I think um, I had to shed, shed that um, and that external perception of me and, and internal perception of myself as well to go and like I'm, I'm sort of just en- enabling myself not to get better and not wanting to get out there. So I think as I, as I went along, I just started to relax and even joke about it and sort of desensitize the topic. I mean, and I think that, you know, allowed everyone else around me to be able to know that, hey, you can joke around with him about his body or just footy or whatever it is. Um, because, you know, I think that's what endeared me to, to players and I felt a lot more connected and comfortable and in turn that reduced the stress on myself, reduced the stress on my body. I actually got out and played a lot yeah. more carefree. And I think that was um, that was a big turning point. And I wish I'd done it sooner, but you never you don't know what you don't know. Mm, of I course, mean yeah. I wanted to I wanted to get back on the park so bad and I wanted to, you know, do everything and show the teammates that I was doing everything right. So I think um, yeah, there was a, de- a definite turning point and yeah, trying to shed that perception of being an injured player to just another one of the boys. It was uh, it was one that I slowly felt like I, turn, like I turned. If you're open to sharing it, because you obviously, did you, were you delisted from St Kilda? Delisted, yeah, yeah. Can you talk to us through that experience maybe and yeah. how that comes about? How many people are in the room? What do they say? Is it awkward? What's it, what's it all about? Oh, it's highly awkward if you know you're going in there without a contract. But I think um, for, the, for the normal player, uh, I think for me, I was a little bit more clued up that I was going to, get delisted um because so my manager even you know prior to to the end of the year he sort of said you know it's looking more unlikely than likely so i think so i walked in there so i set the scene so every player end of season so you you finish the season you have your mad monday and it's usually a day or two after mad monday the exit interview start which is which is i don't don't (laughs) think it's the smartest call but i think you probably just want to get out of the way but um so you go in, you get your times and then you're looking at the, the time sheet and you're going, oh, geez, am I around these players? Are these players in trouble? Are they going to do us? Are they going to delist this batch in a row? So it's literally like a high five system. Yeah, someone's, pretty, yeah. someone's come out, so we, you go in. You get, a, yeah, you get a schedule and it might be like, you know, 12 p.m., um, you know, Wade Cusses and 12, 20, <laughs> Nathan Freeman. And then you're like, oh, you're, wow. you're trying to analyze like the system. You're like, oh, geez, am I in trouble here? And anyway, so you walk, you walk in and there's, you know. You, you want got, to be next to Nick Rewald. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, bet- in between Rui and buddy, who else? Jaron Geary, the captain. But, you know, um, so you walk in and there's there's generally, you know, Alan Richardson, the coach, and St- Simon Lethleen, the, the footy ops manager, and maybe the CEO, Matt Finnis, but I don't think he was there. And then you've got your strength and conditioning staff. You probably get your line coach, your midfield coach the development coach. So there's probably, there could be anywhere from five to 10 people in there, like depending on who you are and, and, and what sort of player you are. So you walk in there and you usually go over your, you know, how your year went and where you think you improved and where you've got to improve. But I think, I think um, I walked in there and I think, oh, credit to like Rich on that. I pretty much sat straight down and I was like, all right, like let's, let's go boys. Like what are we doing? And then Richo basically just said, he goes, mate, you know, we're not going to go with you next year. And, like that, I'd rather have just been told straight away, which is like perfectly fine. And and like I'd I'd no animosity towards the club. I loved the club. I would love to have, have stayed on. But mate, I'm a realist. Like I, as you know, like you know the footy world. It's it's cutthroat, even more cutthroat now. Like list sizes have gone down since I was playing. But you know, you can't you can't afford to carry a bloke who's been you know injured and durability question marks and everything for for five years. You know, let alone putting me on for a few more. It's like I understood the, the, the system and I understood I was in a bit of hot water. So, um, yeah, basically, you know, you don't, don't worry about the pre-season running program that they were going to give me. I just said, you know, thanks, boys. I appreciate the opportunity. And, um, you know, they're all great blokes. Like I, I still see Richo now. Like he's – I think he's footy ops um, at uh, Melbourne now. Um, I still bump in a lot of those Saints guys as well. So, um, yeah, that's just the way it goes. And I think uh, as prepared as I was in my mind for it, for it to pan out the way it did, you can never actually get ready. You, you can't ready yourself for that initial shock as well. Cause I think, and you know, I, I walk out of that room and you know, Luke O'Brien was our footy ops manager and I was really close with him cause he was our footy ops at Sandy Dragons yeah, growing up. So I knew him quite, knew him really well. And I walked straight out and walked straight down to the change rooms. And like I did, I, I burst out crying. I was like, I, I'm not a cry. Like I don't know what, but I think it was just like that, like full stop to like, what I've what I'd been through those last five years of, you know, I'd 
I'd played AFL, played VFL, been injured, you know, been in rehab groups, been traded, been de- now delisted. It's like I'd, your body is was in, I was in like I don't know how to process the last five years, and then for that just to become such an abrupt ending, it sort of just hit me at once. And, and I was sitting in the rooms, I was by myself, um, and the doc walks in and he comes over and gives a big hug because we've obviously been buddy joined jo- yeah. joined the hip for the last <laughs> three years and. You know, one of those things and it, and it happens so quickly, like you, you grab a garbage bag and you chuck your boots in your bag and you walk out the door, hand your key card in and it's like, it's, it's done. So wow. yeah, it, hap- it happens pretty quick and you've got to move on and uh, uh, you can see, uh, you can 100% see why, how players lose a sense of identity um, when, they're, when they leave the system, especially if they've, you know, there's, there's a select few that, you know, they've played 300 games and they've, you know, had a great career and they've retired on their own terms, which who transition out of the game a lot easier, but you know, for the other 95% of, of, you know, the players that, that do finish up, it's, it is a shock to the system. And you do, because you, you, your identity is in a, as an AFL footballer for however long you're in the system. And to suddenly, you know, lose that, you know, title and sense of identity is a big shock to the system. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it is a tough one. I was, I was extremely lucky that my management and the club and Tony Brown, who's our played welfare manager, we had a lot of stuff in place because, as you said, I was in and out of the team. I was in and out of you know, the rehab group. So I had to start thinking about what, what else was out there for me outside of footy. So I was quite prepared and, um, you know, that sort of transitions into, into my play management career where I was really passionate about that sort of stuff about, you know, you, you can't, like you're a person first and a footballer second. Like you've got to, if you just identify as a footballer, like you're going to, you're going to, you're going to go to fucking water straight after your, your career because that's all you know when it gets taken out from you. It's like, who are you? So, yeah, I was really big on that sort of stuff and I was uh, I had a first-hand sort of experience at it. Mm. Yeah, so when you transition into a player manager with Connors, obviously you have a unique experience. Did you relate to players that may have been either, I don't want to say fringe players, but either they've been held back for some reason? Like, that, is that kind of where they said, like, look after these boys? Yeah, yeah, it, it was. I think that's sort of like, that's my unique sort of skill yeah. set, my lived experience, so... I worked mainly with the boys from, you know, the under 17s to the sort of 22, 23 year old players. So I think my first uh, draft when I was at Connors was like the Bailey Smiths, the King Brothers, Nick Blakey. So at at Connors, we, you know, we did get a lot of really high high draft. Yeah, no, number, like number one, number no, one. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. We, we did. Mate, do, I, didn't, I, I didn't see your face in the documentary. Uh, or was that no? He's the, fa- he's the first, the first yeah. doc I was what, in it. But I think uh, – so me and Nick Deishan, <laughs> Just we, no microphone. Yeah, we're, we're, hid, we're hid from the cameras after the first week, I reckon. Well, was, I think that's because Robbie – uh, It was the Robbie – it, it, it was his doco. It was a Robbie and Paul Connor show. <laughs> it was their grand final. Um, <laughs> yeah. But no, nah, they, they, they're amazing. Like, Connor yeah. Sports are amazing. So we did, um, did get a lot of uh, high draft picks and highly talented players and high-profile players. So, yeah, like, I was working with these boys, especially – Sort of my my area, like I was a manager, so I you know did all that sort of stuff. But also, it was more so like a mentor slash big brother slash yeah. um, someone external from their footy club that they can go to that you know has been through it all and has had whatever experience and emotion that these players are going to go through. I've sort of been through it, so I think um, that was that was what I really enjoyed. That was my sort of point of difference in in the industry where you know I can you know go out for a coffee with one of my boys and they can talk to me about you know going out on the weekend and you know being on the pierce or um you know this girl like girls and you've now you've got money and all that sort of stuff like yeah some of these things you don't want to talk to your 55 year old manager about because yeah. they don't they don't really get it it's like mm. you you want someone who's been there and done that as in, and is and around the, the the areas and the and has the experience and and someone who they can trust outside of the club so i think that i think that helped a lot with with the players because sometimes yeah like you are a little bit lost when you come straight into the system you're an 18 year old school kid you're playing footy for fun with your mates and then all of a sudden you're a full-time footballer and you've got media scrutiny and you've got you know societal pressures around you know drinking and going out and you know you're in a hype you know footy's turned into a job instead of just a hobby for you so how do you navigate that and now you've got money and you've got you know people and more friends and there's you know yeah. girls going out. so it's like it's all those things that you, you might think you just get drafted and, and, and play on, but there's a lot of other traps that you can fall into around being an AFL footballer. So don't get me wrong, it, it, by and large, being an, it's, it's an amazing experience, but there is some, some pitfalls that, that are out there. And um, if you don't have someone that you know, has been there and guiding you and, and is a good role model, you, 
you can sort of get sucked into them. So, yeah, that was sort of my experience. So, like, just fill us in a little bit, like, the day today. I know it's like it might be a really mundane and boring question, but for you guys, for Connor's sport, like – you guys as a company, what does a day-to-day look like? Is everyone in the office or is it is everyone out and about? Are the phones ringing all the time? I mean, there's certain times of the year that I'm sure it's different, um, especially this time, trade period. But what, what was your day-to-day like? It's funny, mate. Like every day is different. Like it as a like our phone and our laptop are our work. So as you said, we're, we're probably in the, in the office for half of the week, right? And the other half, you'd probably be out and about sitting, you know, catching up for plays for coffee, catching up with list managers at Clubland, talking about your players, talking about, you know, trades and potential picks and all that sort of stuff. And um, then there's just like the little things like you're out getting boots for players and you're out, you know, <laughs> getting sponsorship deals and all that sort of stuff. So, mate, 90... 90% of the job is sort of just mundane stuff where you just sort of do an admin, crossing the, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, catching up for coffee, just basic welfare of players going out and, you know, all the marketing sort of stuff, how do you maximise the player's brand and all that sort of thing. But, yeah, as you said, this time of year, probably this next, probably from the start of finals to the end of trade period – um, sorry, the end of the draft, that's probably the best two or three months of the year because there's stuff happening. Like you got the finals, you got your players are playing in the finals and then that finishes and now we're, we're bang. As soon as it's grand finals done, now we're in a trade talk. Everyone's talking about trades now and then there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes and then that's done and bang, we're in the draft. Who's, yeah. who you, who's your club getting? And it's it, it's the funnest time of the year. Um, and as you said, on, on the doco, like – that was filmed during the best time of the year. So yeah. it looks amazing. It looks really exciting. But the other 90% of the year is quite quite mundane and quite boring. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's an amazing job. I think after that first doco came out, like I was, like people was hitting my inbox on Instagram saying, mate, how'd you, how'd you get into the, the industry? I want to do it. It looks, oh, so much, it looks so much fun. And oh. it's funny, like I'd never actually got a, a degree in sports management or anything. I think, really? Yeah, no. Nah, so, so basically I... I think the best the best way to prepare for the job and um, sort of going into to sports management like I did was actually having the experience of doing it. Yeah. I've had the experience as the player, um, but also like throughout probably the last two or three years of my career, I was in Connor Sports Office one day a week just, you know, talking shit with the boys and just finding out about because I love the other side of it. Like when contracts came up, I loved going through my contracts and loved talking to Robbie and Paul about it, loved talking – just about footy, the whole footy landscape as a whole. So I think that's why I sort of through my last year at St Kilda in the middle of 2018 that sort of uh, Paul came to me and was like, hey, if this doesn't work out for you, do you want to come on and, and see how you go in working under me part-time? And I just sort of said, yeah, like I'd love to. Pretty much went full-time straight away, loved it. Um, and yeah, was there for the next sort of five years and – yeah, I, I really enjoyed that experience. Um, but yeah, most of the year it's it's quite mundane, but it has it has some fun times. Yeah, I bet. I'm interested to know in the current AFL landscape with your experience, what do you think is probably the biggest issue that isn't talked about publicly? So is it is it say gambling with money? Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? What do you think currently in the AFL system uh, is the biggest issue that players come into the system unbeknownst to them that they fall into that trap? That oh, it's it, it's a it's a great call. Um, I, I, I couldn't pinpoint one of it. I just think it's the general um, – I, I, I think nowadays, I think clubs are really, really good at integrating the younger players into the system. Because I think even – and it sort of t- started tailing off when I was into the – when I got drafted that, you know, the younger players sort of – you just train and you sort of not – not you know, you speak when spoken to and all that sort of yeah. stuff and you get hazed and you get all that sort of stuff when you come into the system. But nowadays – you look at now like Nick Dacos and Harry Sheezer yeah. and Will Ashcroft, these kids are like embraced, ready to go. They're given high responsibility straight away. Um, and I think the pressures, especially internally from, you know, other players and, and the footy world, I don't think they're as there. I think players, I think the footy world embraces players who they are a bit more nowadays yeah. um, and they can be who they want to be and sort of just get cracking right from the get-go. But yeah, like you do have those general pressures of, yeah, you go out and, and drinking and girls and, there is drugs and there is, you know, gambling and that sort of stuff. Um, you know, you're not going to put your head in the sand and say there's not. So it's about, you know, acknowledging that those things are there and those pressures are there but and, and you know, letting, you know, guiding or, or, you know, giving the players the knowledge and the education about how do you navigate those situations because 
yeah, like you can sit in your room every weekend and but you you want to get out and about and you want to like these things are going to happen when they do happen. What what are you going to do and how are you going to how are you going to cope with them and and giving them giving them the tools to to make the best decisions. Mm. I I couldn't help but think I think about um, you talk about the gambling aspect of the game and um, when I was working at St Kilda, I actually got in strife for like, um, nearly got the ass, nearly got the sack. <laughs> really? Yeah. I um, we've spoken about this ages ago and it's pretty funny. Um, yeah, tell us. Well, as free, I would know. I was, I was, you know, the property. Uh, I was champs assistant or one of the property stewards. So I was, you know, the, the the jumper washer, the boot cleaner, whatever you want to call it, trying to fit in somehow. And um, it was grand final day, twenty eighteen, Collingwood West Coast. And when you obviously, as a player, you'd know this, but as a staff member too, you got to obviously do your, your course online through whether it's gambling and through the indigenous um, aspect of it, and just doing your education. Well, I obviously did that at start, or two years b- prior. Yeah. And then it comes to grand final day and I was, you know, I was like, oh, Travis Varco, what a great story. You know, his, <laughs> his sister, I think had just passed away and I was like, I reckon you'll kick the first goal. But I didn't even think, I forgot. And I put money on it and it got up and yeah. I think I won like 400, 500 bucks. And I was like, how good's this? And it was summer or it came into summer and obviously everyone comes back. And you mentioned Luke O'Brien, great bloke. And he hired me. <laughs> I remember getting around, I walk in and he goes, Wade, come in here. And I go into the office and there's like all these papers on a desk. And um, he goes, mate, there's a bit of an investigation going on. Um, yeah, your name's been brought up as... And I went, I was so confused. I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, he, I, he showed me and I went, that was me. That was, oh, a, no. that was actually me. Yeah. And then I had to, yeah, obviously explain myself and... I wasn't with a bunch of mates and, you know, like, um, and uh, I actually had to go and meet with Lethers and, and Luke together. And I was shitting myself. I'm like, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm screwed here. The assistant uh, property steward. I know. Wow, I know. The inside guys. Wow. <laughs> I know. But, um, but I guess the education aspect of, of players and even staff too, like as a player manager, how, how I guess, I don't want to use the word serious, but like how much – goes into actually preparing a player for the system itself. Yeah, it's it, there, there, there is quite a bit actually. I think it's sort of a holistic approach nowadays because you've got your, your NAB League team, you've got your Vic Metro Academies, you've got your AIS Academies and all that sort of stuff, which, and they do an amazing job of, of preparing the players. So it's not just on the managers to, to sort of educate the AFL put in a lot of things now, especially when players, even from under 16s onwards now in the, in the AFL systems, um, they're, they're looking after the players and it's quite, quite professional now. It, like from back in my day, I think, you know, there w- it definitely wasn't as much education and stuff around, around those, um, around what it takes to be an AFL footballer and what it means to be an AFL footballer. But I think nowadays th- those programs are getting so much more professional um, and it's probably, yeah, it's, it, it's a combination of your managers, your AFL club when you're drafted. So you've got, you know, you've got your duty of care coaches, you've got your player welfare managers, you've got your player development managers, um, you've got, um, yeah, like your, your NAB league side coming in, you've got the AFL as a whole who have first year inductions and they give big educational speeches and get past players in and all that sort of stuff. So... I think um, as a system and as a as a industry as a whole, I think we do it really, really well now. Um, and you look you look at the world now, and the age of social media and the age of you know information can go out in in the click of a finger yeah. via Twitter or Instagram, or whatever. So if players are stuffing up, it gets out there straight away. So it's probably like things do. Players still get in trouble, and that's sort of, like you see Jack Innovan gets in trouble for being at Mooney Valley the night before the granny, like that. The age of social, like that doesn't, if, if there's no social media, that doesn't happen. So yeah, yeah. I think it's probably, you, you've got to think, like think, say 20, 30 years ago, if there was social media, I think the play, players would be getting in trouble oh, with yeah. front and centre. Yeah, so probably worse. I yeah. think, exactly. So I think, I think players, um, by and large, always, you know, by and large do the right thing a, a lot of the time. So I think, uh, I think the AFL and I think the managers and I think the clubs do a really good job of educating players. Mm. How involved are you guys when a player does fuck up? Like, obviously it happens, we all do. So is it just left to the club to deal, like you guys deal with this or how involved do you guys get as managers? Yeah, I mean, like our first priority is to the player yeah. um, and the club's first priority is to protect the club. So yeah. you, do, you do have competing interests a little bit. So you work together as much as you can. If so you work with the club, sorry? Yeah, or, yeah, 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 you do, you do. Um, but like I said, our first priority is to make sure the player's um, image and brand and you know damage control about the player first first and foremost whereas clubs 
want to look after their, their club, their image, their sponsors, all that yeah. sort of stuff. So, you know, you look at when, when people stuff up, you know, generally the, the player will either ring their manager or their player welfare manager first. Like or, get on the front foot? Get almost? on the front yeah. foot, yeah. Get on the front foot because there's no point if you've stuffed up to let it come to light through you know, social media or someone's seen something or rumour mill or, you know, the club finds out via the police contacting them or something. So you want to get on the front foot first. But And then from then on, it's, it's damage control. I mean, you, if – you know, you work out, you know, what's an appropriate penalty if, if there is one. Um, you think about the player's, you know, mental health and, and, and their welfare, what's what's the best thing for the player um, and all those sorts of things. So you, you work you work with the club, but I think uh, first and foremost as managers, we want to look after the player first and, and, and get the best um, outcome for the player, um, whereas the club's looking for the best outcome yeah. for the club. Yeah, that's really interesting because yeah. like, – uh, from afar, you probably don't really under like I don't. Yeah, as a player, ma- for a player manager's perspective, the player always comes first. Yep. So f- when I guess you look at all the different management companies, right? How, and we mentioned the doco a couple of times, tongue in cheek, but like, is it really to managers? really not like each other or is everyone okay and because it's it's really competitive mate it is it is cutthroat the, yeah. the management industry i think um and you can i know you gotta play, be careful man, but, some, yeah. some managers genuinely do hate each yeah. other they genuinely do hate each other some are really really close with others um but yeah as as with anything you're not gonna like everyone you they're, they're your competitors you we're all trying to sign the same 17 year old kids 18 year old kids we're all you know, trying to retain our players from getting poached from other companies, all that sort type of stuff. So, um, yeah, and so, some don't agree with the way other other managers go about things, whether they're talking to clubs or whether they're leaking information or whether they're, um, you know, approaching players to sign them. So, yeah, I mean, as with anything, like you, you're you not going to get on with all your competitors and, yeah. and you, you probably don't want to. So, yeah, true. Um, yeah it's, it's one of those things and it, it, does, get, it does get pretty testy at times, um, but... You've, you, it's one of those things like you're going to need um, because players – so if you've got a player on the trade table and then another manager's got another player on a trade table and you're working with different clubs and players, like you've got to work together at some stage. Like there's going to be a time where you cross paths and you're going to need each other or that's why you don't – you know, when you're negotiating with a club, for example, and, and you know, as a manager, you're negotiating with the list manager about your player, um, you can't burn that bridge and be a – be a flog and no. try and – because you've got another player that you might want to get drafted there or you, they want to sign. Like you're going to need to – you've mm. got to keep that relationship. So – Yeah, it's hard. It's, it is hard. Juggling it is, act. It is a juggling act. But, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It's a, it's a, fine, it's a fine balance and the, and the good managers, um, you know, get shit done without burning bridges and get the best deals and the best outcomes for their players, um, you know, regardless of, you know – which club they're dealing with and, yeah. and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it is a fine line. It's You're dealing with people at the end of the day and people's livelihoods and you know, the club's trying to get the best deal for them to save every dollar and we're trying to get every dollar for our player. So, yeah, yeah there comes there comes a time where you've got to meet in the middle a little bit and, and get a good outcome for both parties. Yeah. We're going to talk about the Breath House shortly, but my final question on player management, is there one trade or one deal that you remember that just like you were tearing your hair out? Like you're just like, lads, let's just get this done. It's so plain and simple and it dragged on for weeks and it really frustrated everybody. Is there something that comes to mind? Uh, Particular one? Wow, well, I've been out of the industry for a little bit now. I'm trying to think of one. Because um, we saw like going back to the doco, you'd see like things would drag out for two or three yeah. weeks and it probably could have been resolved a bit quicker. Yeah. There, there, there Maybe is, from the outside, it's a bit easy to say that, but. Yeah, yeah. it's fine. I, I, I couldn't, I, I won't give you a name, but why, why deals drag out so long is because it's it's generally when you're so far apart at the start of the of the negotiations that a player or the the, the manager of the of the club just go look we'll revisit it at the end of the year so is it usually what what tears it apart is it usually money or is it size of contract is uh, it- both both yeah. it's it's money and size of contract um and length of contract sorry so yeah. you know we're trying to get the, the biggest amount for the player longevity and contract wise um the club want to go as short as possible i think one of, oh, probably one of those ones is probably dan mcstay um, yeah okay la, was it last year or the year before um so obviously leaving brisbane going to collingwood um and yeah it's one of those things that you know the the brisbane obviously really want to hold on to him collingwood really want him um and yeah that could have got resolved a little bit quicker um those ones that go down right to the death of of 
trade period because some some deals get dragged out really long because they're waiting for other dominoes to fall before they yeah. do. So you'll yeah. find like this trade period, like some will go through straight away, like the the Harry Mackay one will go through and then Jay Gresham will go to Essendon. Like it's yeah. like these things will just happen straight away. But then until that happens, you know, Brandon Zerk Thatcher might not go to port and then all that sort of stuff. So you'll find last day of trade period, buddy, everything goes through yeah. at the last hour because everyone's waiting for other dominoes to fall. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of machinations and there's a lot of um, you know moving parts behind the scenes. It's, mm. it's never it's never a simple deal. There's never a simple deal. So now we you transition from all right, you've gone from footy to player management, and this is all in a really short period of time too, mind you. So you need to be congratulated for this as well. To now you're a co-founder of the Breath House. Can you share with us um, how this all came about? Mm. I mean, did you always have it? I'm sure. You, you've always been interested in, in getting the most out of your body and your mind and, and all of yep. that but in terms of performance. But this is a different kettle of fish when it's your baby, essentially. Yeah, so it's funny how, like, how you find yourself in these situations and in these different avenues of life. Like, So I was obviously talking about play management. I finished up uh, September last year, so about a year ago. Um, and yeah, I, I had a good mate. Her name's Ella Pike. She's a breathwork facilitator. She's been facilitating for probably four, on four or five years now. Um, and yeah, just basically doing one-on-ones, you know, hiring studios out in Albert Park and Windsor, uh, Albert Park and Elwood um, and just running classes, sort of one or two classes a week. Um, and I think through my career, as as I said before, I was living in such a stressed state, a stressed environment that I did, like, you'd always look into you know, your mindfulness and meditation and all these types of things that are going to get my body and mind like just basically relax, like take take a breather, take get relax my body, relax your mind, which in turn I, I think would, would help, you know, me getting back out in the park. So I started exploring those sorts of avenues. Um, there's obviously, you know, you got yoga and you got meditation, you got mindfulness and it's like I always try to, you know, you got your, your laptop and your app and you're trying to do a, a session and it's like I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm going, I don't know if I'm doing it right. I'm trying yeah. to, I don't know if it's working. I'm getting distracted. Oh, I've got a text. I'll go check it. Whereas I think, um, so Al, like I'd known Ella and she's a breathwork facilitator and she's like, she's always like, oh, come in and do a session with me. Come in. And I'm like, nah, it's not for me. Like I've tried these things. It don't work for me. My mind goes too crazy um, and it's a bit too hippie woo-woo for me. I'm not going to do it. Anyway, it was a Sunday afternoon. It was in summer. We'd, I think we'd just come from the beach and she had a class on a Sunday night and me and my best mate Charlie are like, oh, fuck, like, let's go. We'll go in and we'll, we'll have a session and we'll get dinner after. Anyway, sat down or we'll laid down for an hour and sort of a guided meditation, guided breathwork session. And afterwards, I was like, what the fuck just happened? Yeah. I was like, I'd felt like my mind had completely switched off for an hour, which I'd never been able to do before. Like never been able to do. So got up and I, I literally, I'm like, I'm like, this is it. Like this is like, I tried all these things. I tried to turn my mind off, tried to meditate. doesn't work. This is, this is what works for me. So... I basically just started going pretty much every week with Ella. Um, and in, if you do a bit of digging on Ella, if you know Ella, she's like a fairy. She's, a, um, she's amazing at what she does. She's, in my mind, the best breath, best breathwork facilitator um, in Australia. Like she's, she's amazing. So I was like, we ne- this needs to, to get out to more people, especially um, people of sort of my demographic where like we're blokes, we play footy, we'd, we have a beer, we, you know, but, like as as blokes and as the general public, like where like life is hectic, life is stressful. You're always going to encounter stresses. Like it's not, you no one's immune. So I was like, if I never knew about this, or if my best mate never knew about this, like imagine the other people, like the amount of people that don't know about it. So I was like, let's build, let's build a studio. Let's let's sort of take away from that sort of woo woo, really really left of center type stuff, and let's make it accessible, make it you no know, no barrier for entry. Come in, if you want to come in and meditate for an hour and, and relax, like guided in a studio, you're not going to get distracted, you come do it. If you want to come in and go the full nine yards and have a full release and have a you know, the holotropic breath work where you go really wiggy and you, you sort of, you know, enter Hel- different- Hallucinate. Hallu- yeah. Mate, that, that's yeah. it. You, yeah. you, 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 it like it's euphoria. So yeah. you, um, you can go the whole nine yards, but- I was like, this is just going to help anyone. If you've got a set of lungs, like you're going to benefit from breath work. So <laughs> I was like, let's do it. Let's market it really well. Let's get the best facilitators in and let's just see how we go. Because if we make no money out of it, which you know we, we don't do it for the money, we just want to get the word out there and help people. Um, 
if we if we break even on it, like we're stoked because this is going to help so many people. So yeah, it's what we did. We started up um, community beach sessions on the beach in Elwood. We in probably last December, I think by week three, we had 170 people on the That's beach nice. doing it with us. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like we basically just half an hour of breath work on the beach as the sun's rising, 6 a.m. on a Saturday. We're going for a dip in the ocean. We'd get the ice bars out and we'd all go get a coffee afterwards and connect and, you know, just talk and, and chat and get that community mm. feel. So that uh, we did that for about four or five months and then we uh, – we opened up a studio in April. So yeah, it all happened very, very quickly. Yeah. And I think, I think building that community um, prior to opening and, and sort of giving out, you know, letting people experience breath work for free and, you know, getting understanding with it and getting educated about what it is and how it's going to help you and, and what it does for your body and your mind. Um, as soon as we opened, like we've just been going gangbusters straight away. So yeah, it's been amazing. And it's, yeah, um, as you said, mate, it's, it, I move pretty fast yeah. and it's, um, yeah, yeah. I want, I want things done yesterday. So it's, yeah, it's, I know. we, uh, we got it out we got cracking and yeah, we've, I can't even, I think we're getting about for 600 people through, or about a hundred, 200 people through a week, it's amazing. Um, which is crazy. So we've got 12, 14 classes now actually of 24 people a class and we're booked out a week in advance now. So it's pretty crazy. Amazing. For, for people who haven't experienced breath work, talk to us about like, maybe from your experience, what it did for you, how you feel. I know you've touched on it already, but you mentioned going the full nine yards. Yeah. How far can you actually take it? Oh, mate, you, you can go really, really far. Like, I mean, that. so you, the breath is is the one lever of like your no, autonomic nervous system that you can control. Like you can't control how your heart, yeah, you can't control your heart beating. It's just, it just happens, but you can control your, your breath rate and you can control, um, you know, it's your key to your nervous system. So there's different types of breathing that can elicit different responses in your body. So there's, you know, at, at Breath House, we have one called LSD, which is light, slow, deep. That's a meditative, that, that puts your body into a parasympathetic response. So there's a lot of, a lot of nasal breathing, which um, is, uh, it's, it stimulates parasympathetic response. It's a, your rest and digest response, basically. So that's one where it's a down-regulating session. It puts your body into parasympathetic response, which in turn, basically just down regulates your nervous system and if you're too heightened or if you need if you're in a highly stressful um, state in your life it gets you back into you know your homeostasis where you're back to normal yeah. so there's other ones we have one called release which is a bit more of a heightened response so a lot of mouth breathing a lot of high um uh cadence breathing so you're, you're in through your mouth out through your mouth really quickly it's sort of like wim hof breathing if mm. anyone's had certain wim, wim hof breathing a lot of that a lot of breath holds a lot of um eliciting a a um, controlled stress response in your body which in turn so the way that breath work works and and it's worked and it works for me so putting my body in a in a controlled state of stress is teaching my body that it is okay in times of stress. So in real life, if you're, if you get a um, email from your boss or you get, um, you know, you, you like anything that puts your body into a state of stress, your, your heart rate picks up, your breathing rate increases, you get flustered, you get, um, you know, overwhelmed. Put my hand up. Exactly hand. right. But All the time. If, yeah. you, if you can put your body in that stress state, but being able to um, stay calm, staying present. So if you're breathing in and out really quickly, you're, your body's you're sympathetic. You, you, you'll feel it when you do it. Your, your hands are tingling. Your, your, your mind's starting to go elsewhere. You're, you're starting to get really overwhelmed. But if you can stay calm in that response, it's teaching your body that it is okay in times of stress. So you take that into daily life. Someone cuts you off on the road or you, know, you get an email from your boss or there's a stressful thing happening in, in your life. Your body... Has, you've trained your body to be mm. like, okay, like I'm okay. You're, you, you don't get as flustered as much. You, you stay controlled in, in, and calm in your mind. Um, and you just find out you're just a lot more, a lot more calm and a lot more um, less uh, erratic in your emotional response to things. So mm. that's, that's the way I've, I've found it's worked really yeah. well for me because as athletes, like I get a lot of AFL boys in and they love it because as athletes, for two hours on the weekend, you you are in the height the highest state of stress and highest um, arousal levels in your body. You've got a hundred thousand people watching you. Your your every move is scrutinized. If you stuff up, it could cost you a goal. But if you can train your body to be calm and centered and 
um, aware in that moment that your body's in a heightened response. Your, your breathing rate goes down, your oxygen goes to your blood, it moves around your body quicker, your spatial awareness goes up. So it's these things that it's so transferable to sport mm. and to, to um, you know, being an athlete um, because it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that once you do it once and you understand how you, you can actually control your body and control your, your, your state of your body, it's, it, you never go back. Like mm. it's, it's one of those things. It's like once you're in, you're in and you get it. Yeah, for sure. And that's how the, obviously the ice translates as well. 100%. Yeah, it yeah. controlled states of stress. Yeah. yeah. Are you guys, I'm, I'm sure this is in the works, are, are you guys big on the whole sauna thing as well? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do have, we initially were going to have saunas and ice bars at the studio, but I think the, the breathwork stuff went really good really quickly and mm. I think we just didn't, sort of didn't need to. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Like we're, our thing is breathwork. Like yeah. that's our number one. We're the best at it. We love it. Um, and we put all our time into, into making the best experience for everyone that comes in and does breathwork. So we just thought, you know, the return on investment and all that sort of stuff on saunas and ice bars aren't great um, and it would just be taking away from the breathwork experience. So, yeah, I mean, like when we do the community mornings and get them back up again, we'll have ice bars on the beach um, and, you know, we've got, a, we've got some, you know, good relationships. So there's like recovery labs around the corner from us in Windsor and they have saunas and ice bars and all that sort of stuff. So we've got some good partnerships in that sort of space and, and, and we do breathwork and that's what we do best. Well, speaking of uh, partnerships, we have to obviously bring up a couple of mutual connections and friends of the show. We've obviously got Louis, who's a two-time Dawson D uh, the man. interviewee, yes. And uh, of course, Prime Train, you guys seem to be doing a lot of stuff together at the moment with the runs and, and incorporating in, into the breathing and then the coffees and the community. So talk to us about that kind of alignment. Mate, we, we love it. Like, I mean, it's just doing good things with good people that help others. Like, that's yeah. all we, that's all we want to do. So, like, with, with Louis and Prime, like, so, yes, we do breath work, but we love the holistic, healthy lifestyle, that sort of thing. So, we do breath works. What we do, Louis does his running, Prime does his training and gym and just, like, living that lifestyle. Yeah. So. What, what we're trying to do now with, with our community mornings is incorporating Louis Run Club into that. So you get, you get your run, so you get your physical fitness, you get your aerobic capacity up. You, it's good for you, it's good for your mind, exercise is good. Then we're gonna jump into the, onto the beach, do some breath work, meditation, that's for your mind, calm your mind down, strengthen your mind, become more resilient, jump in the ice bars, jump in the beach, jump in um, the sauna, as you said, and that is, again, training your mind, stress response, eliciting responses from your body. And then, yeah, we all go over and grab a coffee and have connection. And that's like another pillar of health that we love mm, using. So yeah. like, it's all those things. And, and, and we don't, like, we're not precious about our brand and our thing. Like if, you know, we're more than happy to say, like Louis wants to do run club. Like let's, mate, let's partner together. It's going to help our, help our community, help our customers, help, you know, our friends, everything. So like, if it's, our thing is, if it's going to help the people that we love and in our community, like we're going to do it. Like we, we put all the money that we make back into the, the business and back into making it the best experience for everyone. Because at the end of the day, like we want to help people and just do good things with good people mm. and help people. No, you're killing it. The turnout's how, amazing. How, how, uh, probably one of the last questions is, because um, I think one of the biggest and probably underestimated words that is quite often mentioned is the community aspect. Mm. Yep. So like, yes, the breath works great. Yes, the running's great. Yes, the dip in the ocean is great. But, and what I found is living into state actually the last six months and not having a community of some sort, I actually really struggled. Like I didn't have a footy club. Um, I didn't have a, a community like this I could go to. What is so important about creating something more than just breath work or, or running? Yeah, the, the community aspect is the biggest part of it, I think. Cause what, you, if you can give people a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, meet new people, meet new friends, um, all that type of stuff. Like it's like for me and like we run the thing, it's like, it's the funnest part of my week going and meeting people that like I'm a bloke, like I hang out with my footy mates and I've got mates, but like I love hanging out with, you know, the, the 45 year old mum that comes down and goes for a run or the 18 year old kid that loves, loves prime and he wants to just yeah. come down and run with prime. Like it's those things that light people up and, and mm. different aspects of community and meeting new people and having that connection. Like it's in terms of, like you said, that if you don't like, you can train your body and you can train, go for runs and you can go to the gym every day, but like loneliness and isolation are one of the biggest, you know, that's going to 
tear you down quicker than not going to the gym or going for a run. Like yeah. community and having connectedness and, and, and being around people and being feeling like you're part of something is one of the one of the biggest things for your health, for your mental health than, than anything. So if we can foster that community and have fun and provide these free things for people and, and like we and we put these all on for free because we don't want anyone to you know you have to pay to come down and, and interact with people and have fun like we we, we foot the bill we do it because we love it um and it's not about us it's about everyone it's about everyone that comes down and, and has it has a community and, and and get something out of the run and get something out of the dip and the breath work and going for a coffee and you know we've had people who have you know we've got boyfriends and girlfriends that have met at the community events and you know, we get we get a text and it's like hey i met my boyfriend at your beach event on the way and we're like that's crazy nice. and then after we do the session on, on the weekend some people come up to us and go I've, I've been in a i've been in a bad place for the last month but this is the funnest two hours i've had in, in yeah. since i can remember so it's those little things that you just go like i know we're doing a good thing and we're making yeah. a difference and and it just spurs us on to do bigger and better things and give more to the people that you know need it and the people that just want to come out and have fun it's um who needs tinder mate no, no exactly mate, right. I, I actually the it's best the new, it's the new dating it's app. the new dating app. Run, the run clubs are the new yeah. dating app you, and oh, it's so funny like i always say like i'm not gonna make like i'm a single man like i'm, I'm not gonna meet my missus out at electric or uh, emerson like <laughs> i'm gonna meet her out at a run club or something like something like healthy and, and all that sort of thing. So that mate, gives go, our female listeners a bit of incentive that's, to, that's, to come that's, here. I'm telling you, that's it. Like yeah. run, run clubs are the new dating yeah, they apps. Are. They're the new dating apps, well, I'm mate, telling you. It's actually really re- refreshing to hear you speak about this because um, obviously you all have a following and influence, but you're using it that most mm. people with that kind of power, which it is power, whether people like to admit it or not, don't, you know, they'll just try and monetize as quick as possible. So just want to acknowledge you for that. Congratulations on everything you're doing. Summer's coming up. How do we get involved? What's the uh, what's the easiest way? So at the moment, we've got the studio. We run classes every night. Um, so the Breath House in Windsor, we have a 6 and a 7 and 30 every night classes. Um, the community dips will be starting up uh, probably in about a month once the weather gets a little bit better. Beauty. Um, and Louis' run club is has started as of last week. So if you want to get down for a run, go see Louis. And the, the breath work and the dips on the beach will be starting up in about a month. But... Yeah, you'll be able to find all our information on our socials and, and the Instagrams and whatnot. Love it. Well, we'll yeah. have to get down there. I'm keen. Yes, you oh, will, I, I keep seeing Louis stuff and I'm like... He's I, mentioned I, it a lot, actually. I keep going, fuck, I need to go down. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, once, I'll be there. We'll, once you do it once, you're in. You get oh, it. Yeah, 100%. But uh, Freo, thanks for making the time, mate. Yeah, it's, appreciate uh, it's it. It's my to, pleasure. It's good boys. to see you and it's great to you know, see someone you know, so passionate about something. Mm. And, and uh, I know it gets talked about money, but like hearing someone doing it for the goodness of other people. It's not what a lot of people were doing. So just well done on that in particular. Appreciate it. Thanks, boys. But uh, good luck. Thank you, boys.